So today's topic is on, welcome, is on uh, building your own home medicine cabinet. It's a little bit uh, different style, I'm hoping today, because I want to show you a lot of things, have you guys all come up. So I'm going to talk a little bit, go through a bunch of slides, and then write down your questions, or, or try to remember your questions, and then we can talk about almost everything I show in the slide, almost everything I was able to bring today, and uh, we can chat about it, and I'll explain why uh, I like, or I think these things should be in your home medicine cabinet. Um, some of the basic stuff, like you know, having ibuprofen or something like that, I'm not talking about because I'm trying to stay focused a little bit more on natural things or on things that you may not have thought about having in your medicine cabinet in the past. Okay, so we're going to start with open wounds. Now, a lot of people, you know, you'll get a cut or something, and you're like, oh, I need stitches, and then it's a, it's a big pain in the tail to have to go to the doctor and get your two or three stitches, you know, for a small little laceration, a little wound. And, and the reality is a lot of wounds that are small, like up to even, depends on your comfort level, but uh, I'd have to look at the wound, but, you know, you can even go five or six six stitches worth, you know, what you would think of five or six stitches, you can handle at home very easily yourself. <laughs> so, and people don't realize that, and it'll actually look better too, because you don't have to suture it. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, okay, so the first thing is, if you're gonna, if you think that you wanna try to, you know, if you're a hiker, especially, knowing this, um, you know, so that would be you, Jess Ann, right? You know, yes. knowing this and having this in your little hiking kit would be something that could be useful. Uh, it's what I would recommend, and I am a big sports enthusiast. I hang glide, I uh, am offshore sailor, you know, big 44 foot sloops, I uh, whitewater kayak, I was a whitewater raft guide, I, you know, I've done it all, right, whatever, <laughs> hiking, kayaking, <laughs> and I, in, oh, bicycling's one of my favorite sports, so I've crashed and had road rash, all, so a lot of this stuff, you know, I've built over the years, but then when I became a naturopathic doctor, I learned a lot more about how to do things the right way, and, um, so one thing that you should have at home and be prepared for that's very easy to be prepared for, and, and you can make a hiking kit that prepares you for this, and you can use the same one at home, which is be prepared to irrigate the wound with a lot of water. And use several minutes. This is one of the best, most important things you should do for any wound is irrigate. And I didn't, I don't think I appreciated that when, you know, I was growing up. You just want to put, you know, rinse it real quick and put some triple antibiotic. No, no, no. Like two or three minutes of continuous hard flushing. Now, you don't want to push the water into the wound and like open it up type of thing, but you keep Keep squirting it. And one of the best things to use is a syringe. So like this is the one that I would take hiking with me. It's just a super simple, you know, this one's a 30 mil syringe. You can get them really cheap, but there's some multifunctional items here that I'm going to recommend for you. This is an ear syringe or ear lavage, but it's perfect to use for irrigation of a wound as well. So hey, if you're going to buy something, get a two for one, right? You know, so if you're going to have something in your medical kit, super inexpensive, have I highly recommend having one of these syringes. With these tips, they come with several tips right here so you don't mix them up, I guess, or so you can throw them away or whatever you want to do with, if you're going to use them on multiple people. But it's super good for um, ear lavage, which I'm going to go through later, but it's actually also perfect for irrigating the wound. Other things you can use is like this right here. Oops, I almost dropped that. This is a, what I use you know, more from a medical standpoint, but it's great to have it on hand and it squirts really well. See, you can just keep going and just squirt the whole bottle. Just keep squirting and put the, you know, having a dish pan and then just keep squirting the wound, really handy to have. So I have both of these. I'll explain why I have two dish pans later, but um, having two plastic dish pans is a fantastic thing to have and just keep this with it. So that way if somebody has a wound, you're ready to go. But you don't have to have one of those fancy bottles, which is not that expensive either. You can use a syringe and, or you can use the, um, these, just have two plastic bottles, punch some holes in them, and have them under your cabinet, you know, ready to go. Uh, it's really worth having, and if you, you know, it's worth keeping around because when you need it, you need it right away. So don't wait till you need it. Like, uh, you'll be less likely to use it if you have to gather everything up in the emergency. But a syringe, that's the way to go, really. Keep that one, hike with it so you can use it. Okay, so now that, then the next step, after you irrigate the wound, you have to disinfect it. Now, a lot of people, uh oh, see, this is bad. I, I, uh, I put my, I upload my presentation from PowerPoint to this computer and it converts it, but there should be a big red X through these, okay? <laughs> so my red X is gone for some reason, but when I send it to you, you'll see the big red X, but 
please, please uh, see that there's an X through these. Do not use hydrogen peroxide or rubbing alcohol to clean the wound. Hydrogen peroxide, a lot of people we've grown up, I grew up sometimes, you know, learning to pour it on. You see a bubble on the edge and that's great. The thing is, it, it does a uh, peroxide uh, burst, uh, which is great. It kills the bad things, but it actually can damage um, tissue that's already damaged. So it can kill good tissue as well. It's too harsh for lacerations and open wounds, okay? So I would, for a laceration or open wound, don't use rubbing alcohol. Now later, when it's starting to heal, you know, and it's mending on its own, and you think it's getting infected, you can pour some, some hydrogen peroxide on it, but not at the initial acute when you've had the wound. That will make it, that'll damage. So can someone help open the door for her, please? Um, thank you. <laughs> okay, so just a note, hydrogen peroxide is great for some things, but not the initial moment of the injury. It can make it harder to heal later and damage the good tissue. So what I recommend is using a povidine iodine, and uh, people are like, well, is betadine okay? Yeah, they're the same thing. That's just the brand name. So, um, and people didn't don't realize that, but yeah, this is the same thing as Betadine, same thing. This is six dollars and forty four cents. Although I think it went down now to five dollars and something. And you can get it at uh, Walmart, like really inexpensive. This is great to have on hand, and I buy them all the time. And I and I transfer them to little plastic bottles that have a little squirt <coughs> top on it, and you can buy a whole pack of twenty pack of these little plastic bottles that have an eyedropper type top, but they're plastic. That's great to put in your hiking kit. Right, just have a little tiny, or even better for your hiking kit, if you're gonna go hiking, hold on, I have so much stuff, here it is. <laughs> I buy these for my, my travel kits. This is, and you can come up and look at it in a while uh, later, and I'll, you can even grab some and take them home if you could like, but these are um, pre-put together Q-tips that are hollow with iodine in them, and you break the tip, and then it, it's, and the thing is, if you've ever used iodine, it stains everything, including your fingers. So uh, these bottles, I'm just gonna tell you right now, leak like crazy. It is impossible to not have them leak. Like, it, it will get iodine everywhere, even if you try to be careful. So uh, be aware of that. So if you wanna be a little less messy, and you don't, this is, this is just for emergencies, buy a pack of these, you know? and you can put them in any kit you want. And then, then it's easy to break the tip and you don't touch it at all, and then you can uh, you know, use it on the wound really easy. And I have several different kinds. I didn't bring my other one, but uh, those are my inexpensive ones that I use versus Q-tips, you know? And they have, they're a little bit um, just more juicy. <laughs> okay, uh, so that's that. So you've irrigated the wound, you've used the iodine, which is fantastic. It's absorbed into the skin, which is great. Then you can use, especially if it's a laceration that you would think might require stitches if it's a small amount, you can do this at home, really, or on the trail, you know, really, really easy. Um, if you do it on the trail, if you're hiking, since we were talking about hiking, make sure you irrigate that wound with like a whole bottle's worth of water, right? You know, time it for a minimum one to two minutes of just flushing it with water. Then, if you have the iodine swabs, then I would say yes, you can, even on the trail, you can use a steri strip. So, I'm going to show you two different kinds, or three different kinds. Um, these are really fantastic and, and easy to learn how to use, and so, uh, you know, it might be worth, you know, buying a pack. I can't remember how many are in here. There are only, there's not that many in here. So like one is in here. So like this would be one kit for one big wound, right? That's what this would be. Because this, this kit right here is called an emer emergency laceration kit. And it has the Steri strip, which I'm going to show you a little bit. It has an alcohol pad, gauze, and a bandage, okay? And so that would be like one emergency kit. And you can repackage it if this is too you know, uh, bulky for your backpack or whatever. But the main thing to know about these, and you can buy them without being in a kit, you can buy them also just like this, right? And on the other, and then at the same time, pull the wound closed. And you would have to use like a bunch of them. So you could buy a whole pack of these and then just do your own, make your own Steri strip in essence, right? So, okay. Um, so it's up to you what do you want you want to do, but those are three different ways to, to do it. And you can take a look at these up here. I'll open one of them up for you to look at too later. And usually at this point, um, so now you've irrigated it, you've disinfected it, you've, you've used the steri strip to close it. Uh, this is when you can put like a triple antibiotic ointment on it and then cover it. Now a lot in that, and there's two things that I actually recommend uh, before even covering it is um, studies have shown 
and we're taught this in medical school as well, that it's a rumor, like I grew up thinking, you gotta air the wound out. At some point, you gotta like take the bandage off and let it air out so it heals faster. Totally wrong. <laughs> so keeping the wound moist makes it heal almost twice as fast. And it makes a lot of sense if you understand physiology. Um, the macrophages, which are the things that, uh, enzymes and stuff that, that digest and eat up a necrotic damaged tissue, can't move around when it's all dried up. They need a moist medium to be digesting bad tissue and bringing good stuff back, back in. You need that moist environment. So um, you will have less of a scar and you will heal twice as fast if you put, keep it moist. The number, if you have a big laceration or an abrasion, like, you know, road rash from cycling or something, um, you know, keeping that entire area moist and covered is the thing to do. So my favorite thing to use for that is either this or this, and I'm going to show them to you. Hold on. Here we go. And you guys can come up and, and look at all this, but you can use a honey and moist, and, and then you, then after you put that in sort of like sticky, you know, and you just sort of stick it over the wound. What's great about honey is it's uh, antimicrobial, uh, very effective for burns too. So it's great. So it's multifunctional. So if you want something for burns and for other things, and you can cut the piece and make it smaller if you have a smaller one, um, and it won't stick to the wound. That's what's fantastic about honey is, so when you have to change the dressing the next day, because let's say it's oozing and pussy and everything, honey will not stick. You can just peel it off. So it makes it great for kids so you won't um, have them scream if you have to try to change the dressing. But uh, none of these dressings, if they're moist, should stick. That's what's even better about it, right? So this is a very natural one that I've used on people with um, venous stasis ulcers and diabetic ulcers on their legs. I've used the honey bandages on with to great effect. Another one that I like um, is this one called, no, it's the Silver Seal, right? And it's a hydrogel, and that's the main thing. It has a high, non-stick, high water content, may prevent scarring. It's all because it's keeping it moist. So they come in little individual packages like this. They're really jelly and moist. It's sort of like a, a jelly, the flat jelly. And then you just stick it right on top of the wound. I would put it right on top of the steri strips, right? You know, just put them right on top. And then the last step would be to cover the wound. So what you're seeing here, that's what it sort of looks like, right? but they don't stick, so you can peel them right off, which is fantastic. But this one has silver in it as well, colloidal silver, which is also antibacterial, which is great. Or you can use the honey, either one would work, either of the bandages. Okay, so keep the, mo keep the wound moisture covered. So here's the honey. Here's another uh, material that I've used, and it's not in a bandage form or a gauze form, but it's like a, um, it's like a, uh, like petroleum jelly. A lot of people will say, we've grown up saying, keep the moon moist with petroleum jelly, right? Okay, so that's been proved wrong. <laughs> and uh, just recently, actually, in the last like seven years, there's a researcher at Michigan, and I didn't put my, my reference up here, but um, petroleum is a, uh, you know, uh, petroleum jelly is a petroleum-based product, It's and it's not it doesn't, our cell structure doesn't know what to do with it, so it sort of clogs things up. So it makes it harder for the macrophages to eat up the bad necrotic tissue and move things around, because while it does cover it and it does keep your natural moisture in by making a barrier, it also clogs things up. Does that make sense? So this material, like if you had a big, deep leg ulcer or something, and you wanted to fill that area to keep it moist, this would be the stuff I would use instead of like a petroleum jelly. You will heal much faster and cause a lot less problems, less likelihood of infection. And that is a hydrophilic, which means water-loving wound dressing, and I would use that instead of petroleum jelly. And there's many different kinds out. That's just one I've used with, uh, with people before, with patients and clients. Okay, and so the last one is covering it. So, um, and I'm going to show you all of these more uh, later when you guys come up. But if you look here, there's a product that um, we use as doctors and stuff that anyone can use them, nurses. It's called Tegaderm. Have you guys heard of Tegaderm before? They're a product that, uh, like, if you get, you, if you ever give blood or you have an IV put in, they'll have this clear thing that they stick over to keep it. That's a Tegaderm, okay? That, that clear. Thing. <laughs> and you can buy them in huge packs, right? Okay, and um, you need to have a couple of these of different sizes and put that over the laceration, right? You know that you've closed with your steri strip and you put your hydro your hydrophilic material, either that be honey or 
honey gauze or uh, the silver static material, the hydrogel, then put that on top. Then you've just been your own doctor and saved yourself an emergency room visit and copay and all the time and pain and suffering, and, um, and you won't even have a scar. <laughs> or very, it'll minimize a scar. Um, so that would be how I would deal with, so like in a hiking kit, I put a couple of these, I put a couple of these hydrocolloids, I put my steri strip, you know, right? And, uh, and my syringe, and, and then I'm ready to go. Like I can, I can do a pretty big wound and it doesn't take apart any room at all in my little fanny pack, right? So uh, really easy to do. Okay, um, all right, so another, some other options on how to cover the wound, right? So my preference is using these Pegaderm film bandages, and you can get them in all different sizes, like I said. Here's the, the big ones, right? Uh, you can get small ones. You can get them in, also, I have up here, here, I bought this recently. It's a multi-pack, right? So it doesn't give you, like, tons of them, but you have all different sizes, right? That might be, and I got that from Amazon, right? So you can get a Tegaderm multi-size pack, which would be fantastic for, because you're not going to use it that often, but when you need it, you need it, right? Okay, so another way to do it is using Nu Skin. How many of you guys have heard of Nu Skin? Have you ever used it? Yeah, it's awesome. I love this stuff. So this is what I used to use before uh, I went to medical school and realized Tegaderm existed. But these are great for uh, painting over the wound to keep it covered. What I found that happens with this, though, is it's very, it dries, and it dries sort of hard, and, and a, which is great for, like, blisters if you're hiking and things that you need covered because you're whitewater rafting and you know it's your have sandals on you don't want sand and but when it comes time to remove it it sticks right so if you have a real a friable which is like um delicate damaged tissue it's going to damage the tissue peeling it off right so um Sometimes you don't care if you're in the middle of nowhere, like some of the stuff I've done. Uh, and this was like was great because it prevented infection and all that. But then you're gonna have to work on it to peel it off. And I think there's a picture here that shows them, yeah, pulling it. That's basically, yeah, that's really, you know, it'll pull on the skin around the wound. But if you have a blister, it could be perfect. That's what you want because you know it's fine. But um, I love having these, and I usually keep these in my hiking kits as well. Uh, these um, new skins. All right, so. Let's keep going, because it's not all about laceration. So blisters, so I'm a big uh, blister person. I get blisters uh, all the time. I've got like three right now because I was at a conference. I had to walk around in Phoenix. Did you know it was like 119 degrees in Phoenix mm -hmm. the last three days? It's like a big heat wave. Yeah, I was right in the middle of it. Uh, that's like an oven. Anyway, so I'm walking around. I couldn't even use my blister band-aids that I typically put on my heel with these shoes because uh, I sweated them off. I, just, I was sweating so much, you know, it just sweated off. So, like, the new skin worked, this, that little thing, because that stuck, right? But uh, it, was, it was really, so, I've never had a blister band-aid not stay on. So I have a bunch of blister band-aids here. You can buy them in packs. I can't find it right now. But uh, these, these blister band-aids that look like that, they are fantastic. They are wonderful. And usually they prevent blisters and, and even pre-existing ones, they really work great. So I always keep a bunch in my pack when I'm hiking. I never know when I'm gonna get one. But if I'm thinking ahead, I use moleskin. How many of you have heard of moleskin? Yeah, that stuff's great. So if I had been thinking ahead, I would have put the moleskin on before I got my blister in the last five days, and I didn't. So uh, that's super nice to have in your pack. Um, when you're hiking as well. And if you have kids or anything like that, or grandkids, uh, having some moleskin and blisters, um, things are, are really great. Okay, so now we're gonna go into bruises and impacts. And, um, and remember, I'm coming as from the perspective of a naturopathic doctor. So some of this stuff, you know, you can go to the pharmacy and get, you know, allopathic suggestions. Uh, but Tromiel, how many of you, have you heard of any of either of these, Tromiel or Arnica? These, Arnica. yeah, which one have you heard of? Both? The Arnica. The Arnica? Yeah, so Arnica gel is um, really amazing. So both of these are homeopathic, and so I'm not going to go into a homeopathy lecture here right now. <coughs> uh, it, it's sort of an interesting subject if you don't know a lot about homeopathy. Um, Arnica is a, is a particular uh, herb that this homeopathic remedy is based on, but they, it says plus 12 because it has a lot of other things besides Arnica in it. And it's amazingly effective for bruises. So like I got a huge bruise here traveling yesterday. I had no idea how I got it. Had no idea I found it this morning <laughs> in my shower and I put Arnica gel on it. And I also had an injury in my face where I had this huge black shiner and I had my naturopathic buddies put some, uh, some Arnica on it and they literally said they could watch the bruise recede. 
they were walk that's how effective it was. So for most people, it's phenomenally effective for bruises and impacts. So um, if you haven't tried it, if you have kids, kids respond very well to homeopathic remedies, extremely safe. And uh, I highly recommend it. Tromio is what we used at our clinic when we did IVs. Um, and in my IV class, we called it Stab Lab because we uh, were stabbing each other, learning how to do IVs. We used Tromio when we missed the, the vein, you know, we missed where we were shooting for, and then the, because we did, because we were students, and then you would get a hematoma, right? Because the liquid would not go where it's supposed to. And, um, and so we had to feel that and experience that as students. And uh, I had many, many hematomas in that class. And so we used the Tromiel for that, and it worked fantastic. We went through <laughs> bucket loads of it. <laughs> and it worked really, really well. And the next day, the hematoma would be gone. It was, it was really effective. So for bruises and impacts, that works fantastic. And you can put it on your face if you're, a kid gets a black eye or something like that, or bruise on you. It's, it's perfect to put on top of bruises. I would not recommend this for open wounds, though. Open wounds, I would go back to my slides on lacerations, avulsions, abrasions. <laughs> you need to um, disinfect it and cover it and keep it moist. You know. But this one, for bruises, this is the stuff right here. Okay, and you can also get Arnica homeopathic remedy as a tablet and put it under your tongue. And so, like, if it's a, if it's like a big shiner, I would put the gel on and I would get it in the little little tubes. You know, you can get uh, the homeopathic remedies in tubes. Go find Arnica. Okay, for bruises and impacts and sprained ankles, it's really good to have some kind of, uh, you know, ice pack in your freezer ready to go, right? Um, you can get gels too, you know, the gel, the little gel packs that you freeze that stay, but I have these just in case. And, um, and so they, at the acute time of the injury, so right when the injury happens, like if it's a sprained ankle, definitely put ice on it. That will help the swelling not be as bad and you won't bruise as bad and you won't be in as much pain. Okay, so let's keep going. We're going to get to some interesting stuff. So how many of you have heard of a, a SAM splint or what we would call a SAMI splint? Have you guys ever heard of that? So if you're an outdoor enthusiast or something like that, it, most people have heard of it, but it comes in a little package like this. It's super lightweight, you know, right? But it has an aluminum core, so it makes it stiff and it's bendable and cuttable. So you can actually buy something like this, put it in your backpack if you're hiking, and start folding it. Now I'm showing it for fingers and toes, which happens a lot during hiking. People will, you know, jam their fingers. And little kids, jam their fingers and toes all the time too. You can just cut a strip of this and make a little splint and then uh, and wrap the finger in it and keep it um, straight. So these are great to have for uh, emergencies like that, but another way to that works really well for jam toes especially is to just wrap it to a buddy toe, right? Right to the toe next to it. Don't wrap it individually, always just find the toe next to it and then wrap it and that the other toe will sort of keep it immobilized and that looks really great. Otherwise there's not a lot that you can do with uh, broken toes except try to keep them, you know, straight. But for hiking and these kinds of things, you'll see, I think I showed some more pictures. You can use it for sprained ankles and for legs. Uh, like you can fold it in half and like put it and make a brace around your ankle. So if you get on the Sam Splint website, they show pictures of all, all the various, that's what's great about this is you don't have to buy an ankle brace and a wrist brace and a, toe brace, like this will do all of it, right? You know, you can bend it into the shape to be useful for whatever one. And it's so lightweight and easy to have on hand, which is why I recommend them. Okay. All right, so let's talk about earaches. I'm trying to go quick so we have time for you guys to come up here and ask me questions. So recently I've had a lot of ear, ear issues with uh, different um, clients and patients. And uh, some of it's impacted earwax and people don't even realize that they have impacted earwax. but Having an ear lavage kit at home, especially if you have kids or grandkids, I really recommend it. You're only going to need it once or twice, but when you need it, like, you need it. Now, the easy, simple, quick way to have an ear lavage is just get this syringe that I've already recommended, right? I think it's like $8 on Amazon for the syringe and the tips, right? Get it, because it can work for irrigating a wound for your kids, you know, or grandkids, but it can also work for your ear, and it works great. Now, the kits and... The way I recommend using them, and this lecture is not about how to use, I, I'm giving you a brief, like little tiny cursory, you know, how to use some of this stuff, but um, this lecture is not about how to go into depth on all of this. It's just what should be in your kit, okay? Um, you have my number, you can call me on the phone. I've walked people through remotely how to use an ear wash kit. 
in Texas. <laughs> that would be my twin, <laughs> my sister. Anyway, uh, but yeah, you should, when you put it in here, in your ear, I, I always use the words north, south, east, and west. So for the syringe, squirt the entire syringe in a northern direction. So don't squirt it directly in your ear. Try to pick a direction, right, and squirt it, and then fill it up again. Squirt the other direction, north, south, east, and west, because you're trying to get behind the wax or behind what's ever there to un dislodge it, okay? You don't want to impact it further, <laughs> right? So you have a lot better luck if you angle it in all four directions and do a lot. So like with this one, this is the one you can get at Walgreens or in Walmart. It's a, it comes with a little pump and has this little tube, right? And this little uh, splash guard, right? It has a splash guard and this little tip on it. And it comes with a bag with all kinds of stuff, right? So like, uh, comes with 30 more of those plastic tips so you can throw them away and then it comes with q-tips and, and and this is all for like $12 right the whole kit that comes with all this it has uh, stuff to, to clean out the wax although you shouldn't need that okay and I'll explain why uh, it's dangerous to stick stuff in your ear to try to I would rather you try to uh, wash the earwax out and um, so you, I tell people to do 15 to 20 sprays in every direction, north, south, east, and west, right? And half hydrogen peroxide, half water. So use hydrogen peroxide and water. Um, and, but first, before you use it, if you think it's an earwax problem, and I'll find it in a second here. Where did it go? Here it is. <laughs> so if you think uh, you're, like, for example, um, recently I had a person who went to uh, an adult adult went to a hotel and they forgot their earplugs and they're very sensitive to the noises of the ventilation system going on and off and people partying upstairs and whatever right no earplugs so they put tissue and gum together and put it in their ear and uh and it stuck and so they pulled it out and they thought they were fine six weeks later they thought they lost their hearing <laughs> and so um and they were in pain right and so, and they were in another state, and I walked them through what I'm telling you now to do, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing. And uh, I said, go to the farm, go to the drugstore right now, get in your car, drive to the drugstore, buy two things of Debrox. You can get it at the drugstore. So everyone should have this on hand. Really, I believe everyone should have this on hand. And, um, and then buy an ear lavage kit if you don't have that syringe, right? Because um, the syringes you can't find usually at the grocery store, like, or, or at the pharmacy, you know? Like, they won't sell these ones, but these are great because you can really put a lot of force on them. Um, but you have to order from Amazon. These you can get anywhere. Like, you can, if you're in Texas and Minnesota, I don't care where you are, you could, you'll find one of these at Walgreens. But so this person I told to get this kit because they had it. And, uh, but they use this first. So this softens the wax, right? So you put it in there, you massage it in, you let it sit for a while, and then you do it again two or three times. Then you put hydrogen peroxide and water in the kit and then do the sprays. And, um, and in this case, the, uh, the client uh, had a huge chunk of stuff come out and they were crying, it's not working, it's not working. I'm like, count the sprays, tell me where you're at. 15 each direction, right? And then all of a sudden, they went north and then they went west or something, whatever, the other direction. And then it only took like three squirts in the other direction. And they're like, oh my God, you can't believe Dr. Deb what just came out of my ear. <laughs> I'm like, and they're like, that's been in there for six weeks. <laughs> so uh, Debrox works, right? You have to be patient though and uh, put it in, let it sit, follow the directions. This softens the obstruction. And then the water will, will, will get it loose. And this works great with kids and their earwax too, right? So, um, so we're going to go on. So, oh, another thing is after this uh, foreign object was removed from this person's ear, usually if they've had it in their ear for six weeks or so, or if this is something that's been going on for a while, even with ear infections from swimming in pools, like outer ear infections and middle ear infections, you can use a garlic mullein oil. And so those, that's two different brands right there. And um, it's uh, been proven in medical studies to reduce pain, so analgesic, more effective than um, antibiotics and anything you can get at the doctor. So it works better for ear infections. And it, because you're not using antibiotics, the duration between ear infections of your kids or your grandkids and the frequency of them will be increased. So you will have less ear infections and less frequently and they won't last as long. 
right? So um, garlic mullein oil, if you have any kids in your environment whatsoever, you should have this in your, in your kit for sure. Um, all right, so and then for like the client that I had as an adult, after we got the stuff out of her ear, I had her put some garlic mullein oil in and massage it in for the analgesic properties, the pain relieving properties. And it works, works really, really well. Okay, so ear lavage kit, that's what I just showed you, hydrogen peroxide for the lavage. Um, this, where did I put my pointer? Here it is. This came, all of this, uh-oh, hold on. This happens occasionally. Uh-oh, there it goes. <laughs> all of this comes in the ear lavage kit. This is all the stuff that's in that little bag, right? So it's amazing what com comes with it. Um, okay, so now I wanted to talk about uh, Another thing that uh, I think all adults, so here's the syringe and the lavage kit. Okay, uh, you can get, I want you to look at the price. That's not very much money. This is like astounding. And this is a wireless Bluetooth otoscope. Okay, and uh, so really fantastic. I can't tell you how many people would not have had to go to, you know, a clinic to deal with their ear issue if they could have just put this in their ear and texted me a photo, right? Then I could examine the tympanic membrane and I can tell you if you need to go to the doctor or not, right? Like this is an inner ear infection, you're gonna need something stronger than what I've got. Or, oh no, you're gonna be fine, do this at home, right? So uh, it works if you have your grandparent, you know, you, your babysit your grandkids or you have kids of your own, get one of these. It really uh, has helped a lot of my clients uh, when they finally decided, you know, after two or three times not taking my advice and then, <laughs> and then they decided to get one and I've been able to help them. So it's fantastic because you, you, it's easy to put it in anyone's ear, adult or child, and get a very good picture on your phone of the tympanic membrane and then I can tell you uh, over the phone what I'm looking at and then teach you because I'm all about empowering people and teaching you how to be your own doctor so you don't have to go to the doctor. And uh, so that way you can learn on, on when, you know, uh, it's a problem and when you can deal with it at home. So I highly recommend getting an otoscope. Um, they're fantastic. Okay, so this is, goes for kids and for adults. You know, people get stomach aches and abdominal pain and abdominal cramping. Um, I highly recommend for um, abdominal pain. Um, it, it really it depends on, without me doing a full intake and finding out what exactly the problem is, there are some generic, general things to have on hand that can help with stomach aches and abdominal pain. Uh, one of them is that works really well for a lot of people is having a hot water bottle. So, you know, hot water bottles are, are not as appreciated these days. They're like, oh, well, I don't have a hot water bottle. I have a, um, I have a heating pad. Well, that's great, but hot water bottles have a little extra weight and they and they just they're a little bit different for abdominal pain and people react better to a hot water bottle than putting a heating pad on there or a microwavable pad even like hot water bottles tend to be more effective and they have multiple uses because they can actually be used for all kinds of other things like you can do douches but you can do colonics and other things so they're helpful for other things so having one this one right here I got for six dollars on Timu, have you guys have heard of Timu, it's an online thing, and uh, versus this one, I had to get in Minnesota when I was there, and it cost $22, same exact thing, right, so, so if you look around and you're not in a hurry and you want to be wiser than money, I mean, $6 for, for the whole thing is pretty, pretty great price, and um, it's worth just having one around, and uh, for multiple reasons, we'll go into it, but this is another thing I always have with me, I even took it with me to the conference, that I just was at, um, it's ginger, uh, crystallized ginger candy. Ginger is not only soothing to the digestive tract, but it actually prevents spasms. So it's an anti-spasmolytic. So if you're cramping down here, like it will help a lot. So, uh, you know, it does have sugar, so if you're diabetic, that's a problem. But you can also get ginger um, uh, tea bags that don't have sugar. So you can buy ginger tea bags from the grocery store or Walmart, and that works really well too, ginger tea. I, I suffer from stomach aches. I don't get back or neck aches when I'm stressed, I get stomach aches. So I'm a big stomach ache expert, <laughs> just from personal experience. Another thing that works, if you think it's more intestinal, like you're having really cramping and bloating, so you, like you can feel that there's just flatulence and gas and like that's what's causing you to cramp up. This works really well. It's an activated charcoal with peppermint. So that will soothe the entire intestinal tract 
and um, get rid of whatever is causing the problem, okay? Meaning, uh, it can, and it, whatever is causing the problem could be many things. For example, a lot of people get abdominal bloating and cramping because they have a food sensitivity. They ate some gluten or they ate some dairy. Well, this will absorb it. The activated charcoal will absorb whatever's causing the problem and help you. And then the peppermint will soothe the intestines and, and it's also anti-spasmolytic. So it will help you feel a lot better. Your stool will be black, just so you know, right? Because our activated charcoal is very dark, but um, you will feel a lot better. And even if a lot of people have SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, this will help with SIBO because it creates toxins in your gut and those toxins create pain. This will absorb that. I don't recommend using this all the time, but it's great to have on hand when you're really feeling crappy and, um, and, and, and under a lot of circumstances, it's the right thing to help you feel better immediately. Then go see your doctor and find out what's causing this to uh, prevent it in the future. Peppermint tea is also great to soothe digestion. Uh, digestional issues, and this is um, this is an acacia fiber, and this uh, works really well to improve bowel stability and irritable bowel syndrome. So a lot of people have like alternating constipation with um, with diarrhea, or you'll you'll just be constipated primarily, or you'll just be have diarrhea primarily. Uh, acacia fiber has been proven to improve your bowel issues in general. So I, I uh, typically take a few of these. You don't, this is a travel pack, but I bring them with me when I travel just to sometimes you're not eating the way you normally eat and you're, you're in a, traveling is just bad. And so uh, these are great to take with you traveling to help keep your whole bowel motility system working in a way that's not going to cause you grief. Okay. Um, okay. All right, so heartburn indigestions related. A lot of these are overlapping. Um, you know, I baking soda will work. You can follow the the directions on the back. I believe it's something like a, um, a quarter teaspoon or half a teaspoon in, in a cup of water, but it will um, change the pH of your stomach. It will it will make it more um, alkaline and less acidic. And honestly, our stomach is designed to be acidic. We, we should have an acidic stomach. But if you are feeling burning like GERD, right? You know, a gastroesophageal reflux and it's burning your throat. Like I've had clients say, I th I'm throwing up now and I see blood, you know, like that's destroying your throat and that will cause a metaplasia of your throat and eventually will lead to Barrett's esophagus and possibly cancer. You gotta stop that, okay? <laughs> so uh, like if, if you're having really bad acid and you can feel it in your throat, you need to get the acid down, okay? And get that lower esophageal sphincter to, to close and the best way to do that is to lower the acid of your stomach. Not, that's, this is a short term solution though because lowering the acid of your stomach regularly, like taking famotidine or Pepsid or Tums over years will cause your kidneys to have big problems because you're not gonna be digesting your protein and it causes a whole host of other problems that I, have my, I work with my clients on. So please understand the caveat that this is an emergency type thing that you can do is take baking soda, but it works immediately. It will lower your uh, stomach acid. But read the directions on the back. They tell you how to use it and it works great. Aloe is what I usually go to when I feel acid in my stomach. It will soothe my stomach and help my stomach ache usually go away if it's a stomach and not an abdomen type of thing. Um, and then deglycerize, uh, this is a chewable DGL, so it's licorice root, and it protects the stomach lining and intestinal wall. So as a naturopath, rather than suppressing the symptom, which would be this one, right, okay, I would prefer to try to tough it out and just get it balanced, right? So if your stomach's too acidic or it's too basic, this just balances out and protects your stomach and heals it. And so that's the first thing I go to, is I'll take two or three chewable, and they're, ta they're tasty, they're like candy, right? They taste really good. <laughs> and, then, and then I'll have a, a cup of this with some water or juice, and that usually will help my stomach feel better almost immediately. So having those on hand, it works great with kids. You can mix the aloe with a little bit of apple juice and they won't even taste it and it makes it really, um, helps their tummy if they have a tummy ache, right? And this one, the only caveat I'm gonna mention here, because this is all general information, you know, each person I would need to talk to individually to see if this is indicated for you. Uh, but if you take this, like, let's say you decide you love it and you're taking like eight of them a day or something, it, it will cause high blood pressure, right? <laughs> So it's not something I recommend taking every single day if blood pressure is an issue. Now, if blood pressure is not an issue, then I guess have at it. Licorice is antiviral, so I recommend it for um, trying to avoid being infected if you're going to be traveling at airports. So taking a few while you're traveling is great. 
But just be warned that if high blood pressure is an issue for you, you don't want to get in the habit of taking these every single day. Okay? Taking it a couple times a week here and there, or whenever your stomach aches, not a problem. I just don't want you taking eight a day for five years, right? Like, because your blood pressure might go up. Okay. And, uh, okay. So now we're going to go into sinus congestion, some things that I think should be in your, your medical kit. I don't, how many of you use like a neti pot or heard of neti potting? Excellent, excellent, great job. So um, this is the one that I like to use for traveling right here. Uh, and sometimes at home when I'm feeling lazy and in a hurry because you can do it really quick. You squeeze half the bottle through one side and then you squeeze the bottle. But basically you can buy these at Walmart, really inexpensive. It has saline, you know, little saline packets, you know, salt. And then you put it in here. Um, if I think I am really feeling an infection, like I feel like I have something that I'm fighting, I will put one or two drops of iodine in it at the same time, right? And that will help kill anything in my nasal passages. Don't go overboard with that. Just one or two drops is fine. And uh, another thing I'm going to mention, although, because, um, you know, after a while you're going to start learning that this stuff works great for all kinds of stuff I'm going to tell you about, uh, don't ever put it in your ear. Don't even get it close to your ear. Okay, so it's good for almost everything, but I'll tell you, if you even get a tiny, tiny bit in your ear and it gets near your tympanic membrane, it can cause hearing loss and excruciating pain. Absolutely excruciating pain. <laughs> so if you think your kid has an ear infection, oh, I'm going to Dr. Deb, I'm going to put it in their ear, do not do that. Okay, keep this away and out of your ears. Don't put it on a Q-tip in your ear, nothing like that. <laughs> but a couple drops in your your neti pot solution is fantastic for killing flu viruses and um, cold virus, anything you know that might be going around. It works really well to kill stuff that likes to adhere to your nasal mucosa. And then, if you don't like the idea of that and you want to be a little safer, you're like, I don't, I don't know if I like the, the idea of putting a couple drops of iodine in there. Um, another option that works equally well, and I don't have it with me, but I will talk about right here is. You can get these packs now with xylitol, okay? And that's awesome. So I buy bags of xylitol, and I use it for all kinds of stuff, but it's an anti-adherent. It's a sugar alcohol, so it's very sweet and tastes good. So if you have a little kid and you're trying to teach them how to use an eddy pot, put xylitol in it, because then they'll taste it in their throat, and it actually tastes sweet. It tastes good. And um, I don't want you to be drinking it. It's not something that I recommend consuming a lot of, because... If you do it chronically over time, uh, sugar alcohols have been proven to cause digestive distress, right? But putting it in your toothpaste and in your, your gum and in your neti pot, absolutely fantastic because it, it prevents the bacteria, uh, the pathogens, from adhering to the mucosal wall. So there are some viruses like um, COVID-19 <laughs> that likes to stick to your nasal mucosa and then that's where it proliferates. It starts uh, multiplying and then you inhale it into your lungs, okay? But that's where, that's where it gets big, is in your nasal passages. So you, and it sticks like Velcro, it doesn't, like, it, it forms a biofilm, and you want it to release from the biofilm, okay? And the way you release it from the biofilm, you, you make that pathogen not want to stick is with xylitol. And that's why it's so good to put in your mouthwash. So I also recommend, this is not part of your medical kit, but if you're gonna buy xylitol, buy it in a bag from Amazon, it's great. And then you can put it in mouthwash and rinse your mouth out with it. And um, it will prevent the biofilms on your teeth. And then you will, it will cure, significantly reduce uh, your uh, risk of gingivitis and periodontal disease, which is, if you've heard any of my lectures, heart disease is my thing. That's what I'm all about. And so xylitol will, will definitely help reduce your risk of heart disease if you use it in your mouth because you're breaking the biofilm of the oral bacterial uh, in your mouth, right? So if you're too lazy on a, on a trip and you don't want to brush your teeth before you go to bed, put some xylitol on a spoon, put it in your mouth, swish it around in your mouth and spit it out, you're done. That's at least better than nothing and it will help you uh, not uh, have gum disease. So anyway, putting a little bit of xylitol powder in your neti pot is fantastic because it will help um, anti-adhere uh, the bacteria in your passages. Okay, so this, I have a couple right here, two of them right here, I have pictures of. These are steam inhalers. You can get them from Walmart, you can get them from Walgreens, wherever. And I highly recommend everybody have one of these on hand. You only need it when you need it, but usually it's a couple times a year in our household. And um, you can put um, water in the 
cup on the bottom and I'll demonstrate it later. You guys can come up and I'll show it to you. And then you put your face in it and you breathe steam. Uh, you can put other things in it like essential oil, like eucalyptus or other things, but you can also just use water with a drop of povidone iodine in there and you can inhale it into your lungs and it will kill anything that may be trying to hang out in your lungs and it works really, really well. It's also good just with water and saline. You put a little salt in there so you get some saline uh, water into your lungs that will help um, you breathe better and it will reduce irritation. So children with asthma or if they're coughing and they just won't stop coughing, this will help a lot. Um, and you only have to use it for five or six minutes and then it will help. So um, for people with um, respiratory issues and that kind of thing, uh, you can have them breathe the steam, just water and saline. And then if they have mucus that's stuck, like they have COPD, you have them, I will have them lay on an incline, like on a couch, you get them so that way their head's sort of hanging off the couch, or in, but they're inclined a little bit, and you have them breathe the steam from the floor, you know, you have steam coming up. And you can do a pot of hot water too and put a towel over their head if you don't want to buy one of these, although these are convenient. And then you do on their back, now once they breathe for five or ten minutes, the steam, um, if they're having a hard time breathing, uh, the mucosa is all moist now, right? And so they can get rid of that mucus easier and you do what's called tapotement on their back. So you get your hands or you can use a, a, a vibrating tool that has a percussive element, but your hands work really good. And you just do this, all right, right? You do that all over their lung fields, their posterior, so their back, their lung fields, they will start coughing and that's a good thing because you want them to expectorate the mucus that's stuck in the bottom of their lungs. And if they can get that mucus out, then they won't get sick, right? So this is all stuff we should have known two or three years ago, right? <laughs> because it works really well. Okay. And it helps with kids who are coughing and they just won't stop coughing. And if it's a wet cough, like, like they can hear the gurgling, right? You really want them to breathe steam and you want to help them cough it out. And I also have cough syrups I'm going to show you that, that are expectorant. They help you cough out the mucus. And that would be this one, and I'm going to show it to you. I have it on the slides. Um, but there are, if it's a wet cough, you don't want to suppress the cough. Don't take a cough suppressant. Don't give kids cough suppressants when they're coughing with a wet cough because you want them to cough it out, okay? But if they have a dry cough and it's just this dry, raspy cough, then have them breathe the steam and you can give them a cough suppressant to try to soothe and get their inflammation down so they're not so irritated, you know? Um, Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, sprained ankle. I'm going all over the place. So we talked about Tromiel. Uh, you can put that in, in Arnica gel on, on the actual sprain to prevent the bruising and swelling from getting so bad that it causes these giant bruises. You know, you can put it all the way from your knee down. Just put the gel everywhere. And then the main thing that I like to recommend for sprained ankles, uh, what, what I was taught in um, naturopathic medical school, was to do contrast hydrotherapy. Now this is tough, but I'm gonna explain it to you anyway. And so that's what like these two things are, but you would, for an ankle, you'd need like a bucket, you know, a bucket that's bigger. But I've done this for wrists and for uh, all the way up to your elbow, you can do contrast hydrotherapy. So I have two different colors, so that way, you know, we all remember that there's hot water in one and cold water in the other. And you want it cold enough that it's almost like ice water. So you can put ice in it, but then take it out. Like you don't want the ice floating around, okay? So as cold as you can stand, really, okay? Um, and then you want as warm as you can stand like out of your tap, right? So you don't want to burn yourself, but you want it as warm as you can stand without burning yourself. So test it, make sure it's good. You can do this with kids who say, uh, I'll give you some examples later, but if you have a wrist sprain or an elbow sprain or your elbow's just hurting and aching, uh, then what you do is you, you three minutes warm, 30 seconds cold, three minutes warm, 30 seconds cold, three minutes warm, 30 seconds cold. That's it. So three, all threes, right? That's it. So three cycles, Thir three minutes, 30 seconds, three times, and that's contrast hydrotherapy. It causes a vasodilation and a vasoconstriction, which basically pulls the edema or swelling away and it also promotes healing, rapid healing, and it works phenomenally well. And um, <laughs> I've used this on many, many patients, pediatric patients, it works really well. I had a 14-year-old uh, say, my elbow's hurting, I'm like, point, show me where. Like, and so how the person points is also in, uh, informative to us as doctors, but you know, if they go like, 
if they go like this, or if they go like this, right? Like, it tells me something about what kind of the injuries. And this person was like, it hurts right here, really, really, really bad. And this kid was crying, 14-year-old girl. And I'm like, well, what have you been, have you been doing? And then I had to, and I, and I put my hand out like this. I said, grab my hand and turn it like a doorknob. And does that hurt? Yes. Yeah. So all this told me what the problem was. I'm like, what have you been doing that goes like this? Like, what have you been doing that does this? And turns out, like, she was doing violin practice or something, viola practice, like, for three hours a day. And, well, that will pull, all these muscles pull right here, and it was pulled, the tendon was pulling off her bone. Uh, this happens with the young boys pitching, when they're pitching, young pitchers, okay? And they call it little league elbow, little leaguer's elbow, and it's actually very dangerous for kids because they can rip the bone off the bone, right? Because their epiphyseal plates have not fused yet, they're still growing. Right? So adults, it doesn't matter a whole lot. It just hurts and you've got to get it to feel better and the answer is stop using it. But for a kid, you really need to take it seriously when they complain on, about certain pains, uh, especially if they're athletes or something, you know, like this, because their bones are still growing and you don't want the muscle to get so strong that it overpowers the bone where the bone isn't fused yet. Okay, so in this case, I just had her do what I explained, you know, the three minutes, 30 seconds. She did this uh, morning and night for the next three days and it totally went away, she couldn't believe it. She did it on her own after that because it worked so well. Now, you can replicate this for your ankle because it's a pain getting the cold water and the hot water, <coughs> getting it all set up and you know doing this several times a day if you have a sprained ankle. So the cheater method that I found works fantastic for um, sprained ankles is to get this thing right here. And it's a inflatable compressive brace and they cost about $35 now, I believe, which is a, a steal. And they have a cold pack that you keep in the freezer. So you pull it out of the freezer, you slip it in the little sleeve that you can't see in here, and then you, you use this bulb to compress it. And basically, uh, you do the same thing. You compress it up for like three minutes or so, make it real tight compression, and then you release it. You just use the release valve right here, and then you can feel the blood rush back in, right? So you're doing the same thing. You're doing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So while you're watching TV for 10 minutes at night, do this, pump it up for three minutes, release it for 30 seconds to a minute, pump it up for 30, you know, like, and just keep doing this um, over and over. I would say at least three cycles, but if you've got this, you might as well do like five cycles and then take it off, that's it. So you can do it while you're watching TV. Your sprained ankle will heal twice as fast, okay? It works phenomenally well. And you can get these, these compressive cold things for uh, knees and wrists and elbows. You can get them for, uh, and shoulders even. I've not used it on a shoulder, that seems odd to me how you would actually, <laughs> but, uh, it, and then as you walk around during the day, I recommend using one of these for extra support, you know. So those are great to have on hand if sprained ankles runs in your family like they do in mine. Okay, here's a knee one. I've used just as successful with many of my patients. They, they, they're just astonished how well it works. And that's for medial or lateral pain. It almost doesn't matter what's causing the pain and swelling. Um, this will help relieve that pain and swelling. It may not heal the problem if you're having a tendonitis, but the immediate pain that you're having will be lessened and alleviated with these kinds of um, inflatable compression braces. Okay, this is something else that I like to have in my medical kit. You can buy these in six packs, and they're these wraps and this, I don't know what you'd call it, these stripes that you see on it, they're like a, a, a sticky adhesive type of thing, and so they st it self sticks, right? And so you can wrap it anywhere if you have need extra support for something, right? So let's say you're on an airplane and your, your legs, your lower legs swell in an airplane or something, or you're on your feet all day, you can use them like a compression sock, right? Mm -hmm. But you can also use them for extra support anywhere you want. And so the scope of use is fantastic. I mean, you can use them for almost anything. You can get them in a six pack and a 12 pack for very little money. Fan, and they, and I mean, all of them, just they're all individually wrapped and they come this thing and it's great to just throw it in your cabinet and have it for when people need an extra support. All right, so poisoning. Activated charcoal, I mentioned it for bloating with peppermint oil, remember? Uh, but having activated charcoal is something that I think everybody should have in their home medicine cabinet for sure. It helps with many, many things, but it also, like let's say you think you have food poisoning, so I like to take a couple of these with me in a little pill case um, when I'm traveling because I have been food poisoned at airports more times than I can count. And um, if you take a couple activated charcoal, it will absorb that poison and help you excrete it and you will feel a thousand times better way faster if you have activated charcoal. If, you, if your kid has eaten something in your house and you think, 
Uh, I don't know what they ate, and they can't tell me, but I think they ate something. If you call poison control, the first thing they're going to tell you to do is, do you have activated charcoal? Can you give the kid activated charcoal? So, as a, uh, hopefully you'll never need it, but um, it's super, super good for you to have in your, um, your cabinet. You can use it for many other things, but this is the number one thing poison control will tell you to use. And it's good for many other things too. Like I said, even bowel pain, you know, from, uh, you know, if you have diverticulitis, you know, uh, that causes toxins a lot of times. That will help a lot with that. So there are many other indications for it as well. Okay, so poison ivy. The reason why this one I had to put in, because um, I went to a conference two days ago, but right before that I was in Minnesota at my, my twin sister's lake house. And she's like, Dad, let's blaze a trail. So I'm like, yeah, let's blaze a trail. And I'm covered in poison ivy right now. <laughs> I've got it on, on my knee, I've got it on both feet, I've got it all over my belly and on both arms, and I'll show it to you, but it's finally gone down. So over the last uh, week, I have become even more of a poison ivy expert than I was before. And um, so I use all of this, and, uh, and I'll tell you what worked the best for me. So this is the homeopathic remedy, rust tox. I, you know, it didn't work for me. Um, homeopathy is a whole other discussion. I might have a whole lecture on later. Uh, you either get it or you don't. The only one that I would say almost works for everyone was the arnica gel. Like that seems to work for everyone, you know. Uh, but other ones, whether or not it works for you, it's hit or miss a little bit. Kids seem to react better. Uh, I don't know why. This one, Rust Talks, did not do anything for me, but that's okay. This was another homeopathic remedy I got, and it didn't help me at all either. This one works within 30 minutes of being exposed. You can scrub it off, and, and uh, I didn't do it within 30 minutes, so it didn't do anything for me. And uh, this one right here is a, a drawing clay, and I used that about four times. Um, I, put, I covered my arms with this clay, and I've got it over here for you guys to look at. It's just a, um, it's either bentonite, Bentonite clay, I believe. It's not a wet, a kaolin clay. Yeah, bentonite, okay. So this is great to have on hand for all kinds of reasons, this healing clay, but um, it's very natural, and if you can get it on the poison ivy, you know, that region, let it completely dry and then rinse it off, um, that will help pull the oils out as well. I'd say it probably worked, but, it, you know, I waited a day and a half before uh, I realized I had it. It took over 36 hours for it to manifest on my skin. So by then it was there, it was in my skin, you know? So the clay honestly didn't help a whole lot, I don't think, it's hard to say. Um, and so this, they, if you, right after you uh, get exposed, it will bind to the, the compound. So, you know, so I was at this conference and I'm, I mean, I looked horrible, I was oozing, I'll show you, if you guys can get closer, it's a lot better right now, but I was miserable. And, and so I'm at this conference, it was a naturopathic medicine conference, our annual conference in Phoenix. And so there's all these vendors. I went to every vendor, I'm like, what do you have for poison ivy? What <laughs> and so I tried like lowering my mast cells and all kinds of things. None of that works because it turns out it's not a mast cell reaction. It's not a histamine reaction. Benadryl will not help you. I took tons of Benadryl, didn't do a thing, okay? Um, but I will tell you what worked like a charm, which I, I guess I feel um, stupid that I didn't know this before, but if, I hope you all remember this if you're your poison ivy. High dose vitamin C with vitamin B5. And I took it every hour. And within four hours, my swelling went down and it started drying up. Okay? And I've been taking it ever since. <laughs> and I wait. It was vitamin C and uh, plant, 100 percent plant-based vitamin C combined with pantothenic acid, which is B5. And I found some medical studies, you know, because what, what am I doing in my hotel room? I'm literally scratching and itching and feeling miserable, and I'm researching, 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 and I found an article. And it makes sense because I have helped deal with people with idiopathic rashes, which means rashes over their whole body for we don't know why. That's what idiopathic means. It's a fancy word for we have no idea why you have this. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and like, that's very hard to treat rashes. Rashes are very hard to treat because it could be anything. It could be a food sensitivity. It could be a histamine reaction. It could be contact dermatitis. It could be stress. I mean, they're very hard to treat. Um, and so, but the interesting thing is um, almost all skin rashes, I have had extremely good results with vitamin C. And the reason why is because it just like hydrogen peroxide, it creates this um, peroxide burst, but it also heals um, tissue that's damaged. So high dose vitamin C works very well to heal the endothelial lining of your blood vessels to prevent heart disease, right? So I have all my heart disease patients on high dose vitamin C. And um, my dad, me, you know, because that runs my family, <laughs> and um, and it works really well. So I have a twin sister, and she had this idiopathic rash, probably from stress, actually. 
and uh, she had to get cortisone shots like three times. And for three weeks, I was trying to like, Deb, you've got to help me because I'm going to die here with this rash. So finally, I had read some articles that for the same reason why vitamin C will heal your endothelial lining, you know, the rash is blood coming to the surface. And these, so if you can heal that endothelial lining, then um, you will basically close up, sort of like leaky blood vessels. You've heard of leaky gut, leaky blood vessels. And that's what the rash is, is leaky blood vessels. So if you can suck up those endothelial lining, you know, back to each other, the cells, then you won't leak and they will heal. So I gave her high dose vitamin C, her rash went away within one day. So most, this is how I do it, but you know, ask your primary care physician. I'm just going to give you general information that you could apply how you will. Uh, if you Google it, it's, you're going to find that they say uh, there's no difference between ascorbic acid in plants and ascorbic acid synthetically created. And clinically speaking, meaning the results I've seen from my patients, there's a huge difference. Like people respond completely different to plant-based vitamin C compared to um, ascorbic acid. So you can get ascorbic acid really cheap and those big things. I don't see the same results with that. I'm just telling you my experience. Um, I have an example here I brought of an inexpensive 100% plant-based vitamin C that I order, you know, but there's several brands, like I, there's like five brands now that I like. Um, this one's a good one. You guys can come up and look at it. Uh, so now I'm going back to your question. Um, our gut, it's been proven in medical studies, can only absorb up to 250 milligrams at a time. So that means what is at a time? Between one and two hours, depending on your personal gut uh, ability, right? So I'd say two hours is a good, safe estimate. If you take a two, so this one of these is 250 milligrams, okay? And that's fantastic because if you take any more, you're peeing it out anyway. <laughs> right? You know, you're just going to pee it out. And that goes for synthetic. You can get those, you know, 1,000 milligram horse pills and stuff. You know, um, people can't absorb that much. You cannot absorb that much vitamin C at one time. So you'll pee it out. So I, I only recommend buying vitamin C in 250 milligram tablets anyway. Even if you choose to buy the ascorbic acid synthetic, great. Don't buy it bigger than 250. And then, but then it's so quickly absorbed within an hour or two. You, you, you'd need it again, right? If you're trying to heal an idiopathic rash, or if, like in this case, it's not idiopathic, it was poison ivy. So I, um, I took it for me, because I was so desperate, I took it every hour, because I'm like, okay, well, I'm, if I have to pee it out, fine, I'm gonna make sure my bloodstream has tons of vitamin C in it. But for most people, one 250 milligram tablet, you know, every two hours, you know, so up to, up to four, up to four to, to eight a day, because you can take up to 2,000 a day if your gut will absorb it. Now what happens, they usually say you can take it up to bowel, bowel tolerance, because you'll start pooping. Like, you know, it'll make you have loose stools. And so that's usually the limit. Now for me, I can take up to eight of them, of the 250, and I don't start pooping. You know, it doesn't make my stools loose. But that usually means you need it. You need the vitamin C, you're using it for something, right? And for me, I mean, within four hours, I was already dried up. I, I felt like, you know, I felt the angels singing, like, because I was so miserable. <laughs> so um, it reinforced to me uh, something I already knew, which is rashes, skin rashes. You know, if you could take now, why the B, the B vitamin work with it? I'd have to go into physiology and I won't, but they work really good together specifically for poison ivy and how we get that urushol, that's the poison, out of our system. Um, but for normal skin rashes, just the vitamin C is fine. And how much take that? I was only taking a 200 milligram tablet, so that's what I've got. I think I brought it with me. Should I bring it with me? Hold on. Let's see what I thought I brought it with. I did. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah, this was 500, unless they say two. Yeah, so this was 500. So I was taking 500 with a 250, and I did that every hour for at least seven to eight hours. Then I would sleep all night long, wake up very itchy and swollen because my at night you have a detox process and everything gets usually is worse in, in the morning. So you're like miserable, right? And so then I would immediately start taking it again. So like this morning I woke up, first thing I did was take one of this and one vitamin C. And after this lecture I'm gonna take another one another <laughs> because like it, it comes back. Like it's you know it's not gone yet. But right now I'm not dry, going crazy. But last night I literally from a dead sleep, this is amazing if you've ever had a rash, but I woke up last night scratching my knee. Like I was asleep scratching my knee. <laughs> So it's, I don't know how you can do that in your sleep, but I did, right? So, um, okay. Uh, so I would say use all of these, but my, my number one thing is put a blocker on 
And, and even if you think you're, you were not exposed, you think, I didn't get exposed, I know I didn't get exposed, wash yourself with a, an oil that removes it or use a clay anyway just to be safe to get it off your skin. And then I would still, like if you think there's any chance you got exposed, like you went raspberry picking or whatever, um, just start taking the vitamin C and B5 in advance so it doesn't happen. You know? mm -hmm. So that's my opinion and that's from someone who's been currently suffering. <laughs> It almost ruined my whole conference because I was so miserable the whole time. Because it was 119 degrees outside and I'm covered in poison ivy that's oozing. Anyway. All right, so constipation. This happens a lot when we travel, but it happens all the time anyway. Um, if you get a magnesium supplement from the store, like Walmart, the, almost always, if it says magnesium on it and it doesn't tell you what kind, it's almost always oxide. Okay? So really, when I think of magnesium oxide, the only thing I think of that it's useful for primarily is constipation. So if you need to poop, take magnesium oxide, <laughs> but, um, which is great. It's like really good. And it's, and it's good for some other things with heart disease and all that. Uh, so that's interesting. It, it's been shown to chelate calcium out off of your arterial walls and things, but it'll make you poop. So you got to be careful with it because you don't want loose stools. But um, this is really the only time I would recommend, because you can only absorb about 10% of it. Okay, so it's it's for pooping is what it is. Okay, and another thing is um, this emergencies. Have you guys seen these before? These are great for traveling. So like if you're having, or even at home, if you if you feel like you're not pooping, you know you're just constipated, then I would use you know take an electrolyte balance. This is why I like the vitamin C that's in this, even though this is synthetic ascorbic acid. I will admit, uh, it works really well because with the magnesium oxide, you, you will not be constipated anymore. Like, and it will not be uh, violent. Like, it's not gonna be an aggressive form of, you know, it'll be a healthy way of having you start. Yes? Mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to have surgery, and I know pain medicines cause, cause constipation. So very safe. Start with that? Yeah, very, very safe. So you can even get, like, you know, for someone who wants to naturally, by not taking, you know, fiber and all this other stuff they sell off the shelf, like a, a safe way of getting your system balanced and pooping that's safe and nutritive, like a nutritive way of doing it. I would say take, drink one of these a day, right? You know, a thousand milligram packet. And then you can get this right here, magnesium calm, okay? You can get it in packets too. So if you're traveling, so like for people who travel, I recommend getting a pack of these and getting another box that looks just like this, but it's a blue box and it has the little packets with magnesium calm powder in. And throw a couple of them in your backpack for the your carry-on, throw them in your luggage and just take one. You can take, I, you can take up to two of these and two of these a day. So. You know, that's a lot. But normally, it only takes one of each, and you will be feeling great, right? That's even without the magnesium. This is the magnesium. Or that it, yeah, oh, this that is magnesium. Right. Yeah, magnesium. this is magnesium. That's what it is. Okay. But this is magnesium citrate, and it also makes you poop, but not as much as that one. It's, uh -huh. um, it's about 20 to 25% absorbable. So you're gonna get the muscle relaxation, and you'll get you'll, your, everything, you'll sleep better, so it's great for traveling, it's great for using before you go to bed at night, because it, it also promotes muscle relaxation. Um, but if you really are having, like, if constipation's all you're worried about, you know, like, that's the one right there. <laughs> but, but for most people, you don't need to be that harsh, and so a packet of this, or a spoonful of this, and a packet of this, you'll, you'll take it before you go to bed at night, Everything, you'll have all the, it's like nutritive, and it's a, a natural way of making sure your bowel is stable and uh, functioning properly. And um, so that's what I recommend. And then if, if you're desperate, like you're just, it's been three days and you're still, you're not pooping, you know, and you need to, right? This is great to use, okay? I don't know if you've heard of this tea. It's a senna tea. It's a laxative, highly laxative. And uh, I don't recommend you use it very often, though, because it will cr you'll upregulate your your epistaltic motion. That's the muscle squeezing motion of your intestines, and you'll start becoming addicted to it. So Senna and uh, Senecot, if any of you have heard of Senecot, I don't recommend. That's not in my mind. Even though it's a natural product, like it's an herb, it's not a, what I would call a natural, safe way of helping you be regular, because it will make it so when you don't take it, you'll definitely be constipated. Right? Uh, so you don't want any side effects is what it is. And so magnesium and vitamin C are the way to uh, poop naturally. And if they're not, if they're causing you problems, then you know, drink a cup of tea, of the senna tea, that will work, just don't do it regularly. It's not something I want, it's emergencies. Okay, so diarrhea, this is something that um, I tend more towards this side. My stool got very loose. 
You take Saccharomyces boulardii, and I'm telling you right now, it says for occasional diarrhea, it supports healthy balance of uh, intestinal flora, it works really well. You will stop your diarrhea. And I've had uh, patients come to me recently, actually, who uh, stopped going to church and other things because they, you know, were having this was a problem for them, right? And uh, within like two days, it solved their problem. <laughs> That's the only thing they did. So it really helps a lot. Now, if you tend towards constipation, don't take this probiotic. Take other probiotics, right? <laughs> Make sure your probiotic does not have this because it will uh, help your stool be more firm, okay? But it also does many other things, but it, it enhances your intestinal tract support, right? So it definitely does. Your whole intestines will feel a lot better with Saccharomyces boulardii. So, like, great to take traveling, that kind of thing. You can get them in, like, you know, all different travel sizes, all that stuff. Okay. Um, it's also good for traveler's diarrhea. I think they say that on here. Good for traveler's diarrhea. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, it's good for traveler's diarrhea because uh, it'll balance you naturally. It's not. It's not a pharmaceutical. So, okay. Bug bites. There's sting relief stuff for kids. I definitely recommend this one. That's a great one to have. You just rub it on the on the, the um, bug bite, and uh, we're going to keep going. Okay. Ticks. Ticks are something that we have a problem with around here. Uh, so I have designed my own tick kit right here, and I can talk to you guys about it more because I'm talking too long right now, so I'm going to go quick. And I'll go through all the pieces of my personal tick kit that I make for people if they ask me to. And it has a tick removal tool, and, um, and then it has this little um, vacuum puller thing here, uh, and then an alcohol pad, and then you, uh, th you I apply a charcoal mask, which you can use... So the, the kit, I use those charcoal nose strips, right, because they're portable. You could put, like, for pores on your nose for acne. And so that's what I bought right here, and I cut them in half, and I put them in my kit. But you also can use a charcoal mask that you can get from um, Big Lots. And you can get even smaller ones than this for a dollar at Big Lots. And it's a charcoal mask. So you put that on, but you could also use the healing clay. You just want something that's going to pull any of the local toxins from the from the tick out, okay? And um, and the reason why ticks are a problem is because people get Lyme disease and all those, and that's a big deal. And if you can do this within 24 hours of, of the tick, um, actually, some studies say that the tick actually pulls, and it's the saliva, anyways, I could talk about Lyme a long time, but within even four days of the tick being on you, uh, if you get it off in that, within those four days, you can have to decrease your risk of Lyme or any other contagious pathogen acquiring it from the tick if you try to do a procedure like this, okay? So I can talk to you guys more about that. Um, if the tick's been on for a week, they'll start regurgitating the stuff that's, because it starts getting engorged and it pushes it back into your bloodstream and that's when you start getting a lot of the pathogens is when they've been on for longer than a week. Yeah. So, uh, so, can I ask? Yeah. Um, I know for some things uh, I've been told and used uh, things like garlic to pull. Uh, would that help with ticks too? Or so, is this still the best thing to charcoal? Um, garlic is not a drawing compound. So okay. it won't draw, right? So you'll need something like uh, this healing clay, which is like a draw. It, you'll feel it pull on your skin when it dries, right? Okay. And the same way with the charcoal. But the charcoal doesn't, it draws a little bit, but it binds. Does that make sense? So, so this mixture right here, uh, it's designed to pull, and then the charcoal binds. Okay. So then you're pulling, you know, getting rid of it. Does that make sense? Uh, so like this one, the clay, you could put on it, it would draw, it'll pull anything in the immediate local region out, and then you rinse it off, and then, you know, you, because it, it pulled and binded, and then you can pull it off. But garlic's antibacterial. Okay. So, you know, Great, so that would be cool. this step right here. Okay. Right, the little iodine, you know? <laughs> you know, and it's very antibacterial. In fact, some studies have shown that six cloves of raw garlic, if you mash it up and wait 15 seconds, because that's when you activate the allicin and all the antibacterial components, uh, so you have to mash it, you have to crush it, but if you eat six of them and swallow it, which I will never do in my life, yeah. then you'll, uh, that's equal to a dose of penicillin. So very, very antibiotic, and, but that's hard to do, and like I would think it would throw up if I ate that. I don't know if I can, my stomach can handle it. But um, yeah, garlic's great for um, killing things, um, and, and that's a whole other topic. I, I really love black garlic for chelating calcium out of your arteries to prevent heart disease. So uh, 
because the, the, all the allicin, that's the sulfur co co smelling component when you turn it into black garlic, which is an aging process, the Maillard process, it turns into seven different cysteines and those cysteines are sulfur and they bind to the calcium in your arterial walls and helps chelate it over time and it's delicious. It's really good. Anyway, that's, all, that's my heart disease lecture. I'll have to talk about that in my heart disease lecture. Okay, so kidney stones, this is something that, it, you know, if, if kidney stones is not an issue for you or your family, don't put this in your medicine kit. But if you know someone in your family has kidney stone issues, uh, I, you, have, you need to have this in your uh, medical kit or in your tea cabinet. This is called Chonka Piedra, and it's a tea. And they taste pretty good. It's green. It's an herbal taste. It's not, I don't think, delicious, but not... Uh, not disgusting, right? And um, it will dissolve um, some kinds of kidney stones, just different kinds, but if it's a calcium type one, it will help uh, get rid of that stone and the pain. It's, it's one of the best things I've found to help people who have recurrent kidney stones, if they just drink this tea regularly, and if they drink it acutely, like in quantity, it will help them get rid of, um, dissolve that stone. Okay, uh, depending on the size and everything else. <laughs> Okay, so urinary tract infections, this happens to a lot of us more and more as we get older. Uh, it happens to a lot of younger women too, you know, usually early 20s or 20s and then older people is what I find. Um, D-mannose is really highly recommended. So if that's something that happens to your, like a lot of elderly people, elderly males, as your prostate gets um, bigger and starts squeezing on the urethra, it causes um, stasis of the urine in your bladder. And so men, older men are much more prone to urinary tract infections. Taking this daily prophylactically, you know, as a preventative, fantastic. It's a nutrient, healthy urinary tract, and it works really well. There's tons and tons and tons of studies on it, and um, it's fantastic. So especially young women who are getting a lot of urinary tract infections, or anyone who gets chronic, recurrent urinary tract infections, d is the way to go. Um, if you have it, if you already got it, then, um, then you go more towards these. So this is more prophylactic, although it can help um, minimally once the infection is happening. These are what I would recommend, these two especially, for once the infection has happened and you're trying to get rid of it, because they're highly antibiotic. And, um, and then this is what I recommend <coughs> almost all of us as people 50 years old and older should take glycine at night. It's a muscle uh, relaxer, so it helps you relax your muscles. But for men, studies have shown that it prevents urinary tract infections, so that's a bonus. Uh, it helps you sleep at night, and it helps you build lean muscle mass. So it's basically like if you see those bodybuilders, they have all those big containers of stuff they buy for bodybuilding, those powders. This is one of the, the amino acid uh, protein ingredients that's in those. This one's specific, though, uh, for building lean muscle mass, helping you sleep at night, and preventing urinary tract infections. So it's like a triple, triple one, especially for older men. But even I even recommend it for women for the lean muscle mass for uh, menopause and those kinds of things. Okay. We're over. I apologize. We have eye issues. Okay, I'm going to stop. There's just a lot here. You guys can look through it. How about you guys come up and just um, ask me questions, and, uh, and I will be sending you this presentation so you can um, go through it, and, uh, and I'd say please ask me questions in the emails, okay? Because there's a lot more here. It was just hard to get it all in here. So I have a lot of pediatric recommendations as well, and um, so there you go. Hey, Deb. Yeah. On that uh, bruising, you know, you were talking about that, was it a cream or something? It's a gel, like an Arnica gel. You can get an Arnica cream, too. You, you know, it's like elderly friends that bruise so easily.